Hey traders, this is T Bradley 90 from the My Investing Club chat. I'm one of the top mentors and moderators in chat. As a special gift to our viewers on YouTube, we have created a free two hour course to help teach you how to start a consistently profitable trading business and identify high paying setups in just 30 days. There will be limited seating every week, so register for the course and reserve your spot now using the link in the description. As a special bonus for everyone that watches the entire video, we will give you the link to a free 10 hour additional mini course that has never been released to the public. Register now before all slots completely fill up. I talked about how important it was to add to the winner. And I, and I kind of touched upon like how important it is while adding to your winner to keep your losers in check. So today I'm going to do the other half of the coin, like how to manage your losers and when you can sneak in like and add it to a winner and then we're going to incorporate that. So I'm going to talk about maybe the, mostly the other side of the coin. So, um, yeah, so I wanted to call this webinar cutting losses, but every, you know, like that's, that's too, um, I mean, everybody knows that you're supposed to cut losses. So it's, you know, like, I feel like this is a better title managing losers because that's, that's more of what I feel like I'm doing rather than just like cutting a loss when, when, I, when I'm taking a trade that doesn't work. So anyway, let's get into it. So um, <clears throat> going to talk over the key, key traders that we took this week. There was actually, there was actually some decent ones. I thought it was going to kind of slow down after the crack week and it did, but we still had some movers. So that was pretty good. I, I, I took it really easy during crack week because there was just, you know, unfortunately there was just nothing that I super liked. Um, I mean, there was volume and range, but I guess, I don't know, maybe I'm just more careful now. Like I used to get a little, maybe a little reckless during crack week, but this week, this time around, I, I was really conservative with it. Uh, I, I got a trader topic I want to talk to you guys about. I'll save that for later. Um, we're going to go over the market sentiment as usual, and we're going to talk about how to manage your losers, right? Because we all have them. It's, it's, it's literally, I think, the most important part of being a trader. And then we'll open the door to Q&A. And if anyone wants to hop on and talk, we can do that too. All right, so uh, EYEG was a trader. Uh, this was right before, this was during the crack week. Um, and th that's why I initially got long bias on this stock. And you can see that I tried to long it like three times. Or yeah, yeah, like three times, uh, twice. I longed it twice every second once. <laughs> But basically, like at the start of practice, I was really hoping that we were going to get some movers. So basically, I was kind of long bias on everything, right? So, you know, this is just a classic reclaiming, like a stuff, uh, you know, a, a move back up, um, a, a higher low, and I'm buying the, the higher high. Very classic, right? I have like six, I have like six videos on this in the vault, right? Um, sold some at, at the first resistance level. It dipped. I recycled. It popped back. And you know, I already sold some here. If I was Bow, I, I would have sold some again. But, you know, I'm not Bow. I, I was going for more of a bigger trade. I wanted tens and we didn't get it. So I ditched it, right? So this is a good example of selling, you know, a good example of a recycle. We just talked about that, you know, just buying it, selling the piece right there, just trusting that it's going to fail the first time, kind of like a little first resistance. Like, like I talked about last time, when you're recycling, the goal is to take advantage of little mini trades in between your idea. Now, my idea was tens. Um, this is, Jan was a good example of a quick first bounce trade. I took, um, uh, I, again, like, so this was, someone asked me, why were you buying this stuff? Like, it just stuffed epically. Why in the world would you long something like that? And it's a good question. It's definitely more of an advanced trade, but there, there are things that I was taking into consideration. One, where, you know, it was crack week, right? This was 11.25. This was the Thanksgiving week. For those who don't know, crack week is Thanksgiving week. It's normally one of the busiest weeks of the market. So I'm expecting everything to run. I'm, I'm very long biased on the entire, on the entire market. So, so, you know, stuff like this, I really want it. I really want it to be able to go, right? Like I really want reclaims to happen and I'm more aggressive on the long side so I'm willing to get in here right so what I was trying to do is take advantage of this panic right this stuff here take advantage of the panic chase hopefully that could fuel the right fuel the the big move that I expect during that during volatility week um, but you know rules are rules and I did I did end up selling some I tried to recycle it here uh, but I ditched it 
when, when we stuffed. And then I decided to buy again once that stuff, once that tank held, I'm like, okay, maybe now we can go. I ditched that again, right? So I, just another example of not getting, even though I'm excited for the trade, not to get too attached. It's a very fine line on, you know, I want to be convicted in my idea, but I don't want to overstay. If something's clearly not working, uh, I want to, I want to, I want to not have too much skin in the game to where I can bail, and that allows me to get back in if I, if I want to. Um, CCXI was a fun one. Uh, I eventually got this later, but I didn't save the chart because um, it was just a, it was just a more of an afternoon kind of trade. But um, I, I don't know. I just saved the screenshot of this one. Um, this was a trade uh, that kind of faded all day this day. It just, it, it really went down. Um, I think, I think Sam hit this one too. I'm pretty sure Sam hit this one too. This was a fun trade. Um, this was a stock that, that was way overblown, way overextended. Like this had a, this had a huge gap and you know, everyone is waiting for it to tank basically. And so I was waiting for it to tank too. I didn't want to go contra of what seemed obvious. It seemed like an obvious short, but I, I, I didn't want to like get caught shorting and then like, like I, if I would have shorted the morning, I would have covered up here and then would have been pissed down here. You know, likely I would have shorted down here in revenge, right? Or, I mean, not likely me, like in the past I would have. And I've evolved to where I avoid that kind of crap by just waiting my turn, waiting for something that I like, right? Just, and I, I like the breakdown shorts. Um, it's close to a first red day short, but we were so high above, um, the prior close, I, like that wasn't gonna happen, or you know what I mean? That wasn't going to be realistic for me to wait for that. So what I did was I waited for a breakdown of the morning low, which is what I consider to be this 945 low here. Once we get our first strong bounce, when we come back under there after a strong bounce, that to me is saying, hey, not even the bounce worked. Maybe now we can fade off and like kind of have a similar first red day kind of trade, but you know, it's only on day one and it's a huge gap. So, you know, red to green's too far down to wait for that. You know, that's more of the target rather than the entry. All right, so CLT, CLWT, this was, was a few days ago. This was a continuation long. And if you guys have seen me talk about in any videos or whatnot, I suck dick at continuation longs. Like I'm, I'm just terrible at them. I like normally, but these particular ones are my favorite. And this is the one where I feel like I, I'm trading the knowledge that's important, but nobody else seems to be right. So this one had, um, what I uh, call an FLE, a forward looking event. It had forward looking event hype, right? Um, now this is a month old PR. If you look at CLXC, they had like a PR, uh, not maybe not a month old, but way in November. Right, it had a way in November PR about uh, and it, uh, I think it was a presentation yesterday on the fourth, right? And so this was on the third, right? So this is the day before the presentation, and when it was moving, you know, for, as far as the news goes, you would have had to like zoom way down in the news to find this. So it's not necessarily fresh on everybody's mind that it's you know that it's possibly perking because. There's a whole bunch of buyers who just came in who just found out about the forward-looking event. And so they're, they're hyped about it. They think it's going to five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, wherever. It's, there's an event tomorrow. It must be important. Right? So there's hype about this forward-looking event. But the people who are trading it intraday, like the day traders, all they see is a, is, is a crappy company, cheapo stock that's popping up that's probably going to pop and drop like they most do. Right? That's all they see. But so, um, you know, they're – excited buyers today and the intraday shorters were not taking into consideration the old news probably because they didn't even look right so this is where i kind of feel like i have like almost this hidden knowledge almost like this inside information in a sense when it, it's not inside information i just looked I, I read the news and i felt like there'd be some continuation and actually i was actually expecting this to kind of grind out all day and then go up further right but the problem is is unless it kind of happens fast right? Unless it kind of happens fast, people figure out what the, the cause of the move is. And then now that everybody knows the information, it's no longer special. So um, PTGX is today. Um, this was a low hanging fruit plate. I wanted to include this one just because I never, ever partake in low hanging fruit. It's so rare. And like I was, I, you can tell I got it on the red candle here because I wasn't even ready. Like 
I had this on a back radar um, to, to short if it popped. I looked over and I saw it popping. I'm like, holy crap, like, like this is it. I need to get in it. Like the red greens right here. So like, as I get in, like, like I'm looking at the bid in the ask and I, I put my, I put my order right here. Like I was trying to get Phil on the ask at like 807 and I was like, there was like zero chance of that happening. So I just hit, I just hit, I just took the bid and got in and I'm glad I did. And this is, this is an example where you can't be too perfect, right? Like, like, yeah, like, okay, I wanted 807, but like, I mean, if I plan on covering in the seventies or sixties or fifties, am I going to let five cents really take that away? Right? Like, no. So I took it, it was right there at $8. And this isn't, this is how I, this is what I love on low hanging fruit, right? Or, or any trade really, but I like to group stuff, group variables, just, kind of just like I would go over, like I just talked about, I like to group my variables when it comes to figuring out how much I like a trade or not. Oh God, I am recording, right? Okay, good. I don't know, I just, I, just, I mentally just forget. Okay, yeah, so there was a red to green line here. That's always a good line for um, low hanging fruit plays. It had $8 whole number resistance. You know, if you can couple a whole dollar with your resistance, even better. And it was a low hanger, right? The fact that we had AUPH, a super exciting stock, that really takes the attention off of the boring ones. And that's the whole concept of a low hanging fruit. But I really like low hanging fruit when there's uh, like a super play, like something that's super juicy, like AUPH, something that's up a hundred percent and it has like, you know, $15 of downside to go people that, that really draws people attention, you know? Anyway. How do you go about, oh, like, okay, how do I go about a new setup? Oh, I haven't had one in a long time. And that's because um, about a couple of years ago, I figured out I know all the setups I'm going to know, like, well, that I like. Anyway, I'm comfortable with all the setups I know now. But, like, um, I guess I just don't like any of the complicated setups. That's the reason. So, but when you go, when you know, when, when trying to learn one, the first thing, the, and this is what I, 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 I bet I tell, I bet I've told like half the people in this room on phone calls this at one point. The first thing that you do when you try to learn a new setup is not try to learn a setup that you see someone else do. The first, like, you don't look at a chart and be like, I want to learn how to do that. Like, oh, that guy got the top of that parabolic. I want to learn how to do that. The first step in learning a new setup is to watch stocks and price action without trading with your, with sitting on your hands with no intention to trade and just watch day after day, after day, after day, after day, and wait until something slaps you in the face, right? That's what you have to do. You have to wait until someone, something slaps you in the face because that basically you wait for something to, to just scream at you and say, I'm predictable. Like you saw me do this 10 times last week. I, you know, I'm doing it again. So you need to, something to scream at you slap you in the face and say trade me right like short me now because you might not know why you just like you get a feeling it's going to tank or it's going to rip right you, you got a feeling that this stock is going to be up later or down later whatever it is it's gonna you know whatever you know to, oh every time i see this tomorrow it's up right so i need to buy today and sell tomorrow right it's like whatever something is going to scream at you and that's your first step of a new trade the second step is to figure out what you're seeing and figure out why you're seeing it and really and the second step is to hone in on what it is that you um, need to learn about the setup to make it you know to process it and make it a strategy right figure out what you know what you, you know what your entry needs to be where it can go your exit your entry your risk uh, your entry your exit your risk and um, your contingencies. Like if it does this, then I know the trade's not on anymore. Or if it does this, then I know I can add here, right? Or like when, how long should the trade, trade take? You really dissect into that. Um, and you, the, that's kind of like step three. You, step two and three is, step two is back testing it. You get, grab a whole bunch of pictures of it and then, you, and then you do step three at the same time. You gather all your information to back test. And then step three, you back test and you figure out all these answers. And then step four is you test it out, right? But the most important part is that you cannot learn a setup just by looking at a chart and being like, I want to learn how to trade. Like, oh, look at what that guy did. I can do it. 
Like, cause now you're not seeing the stock through your eyes. You're trying to see it through somebody else's and you're going to lose that way. Like you, the only way you can learn a new setup is through your own eyes. Like you have to own, and I say this all the time, you have to own the knowledge. The knowledge has to be yours. So like, you know, Val and Alex and I, we can tell you stuff, but like it, like you're going to understand it 300% more if you see it like the next day on your own or something like that, right? Like, you can't just like, no one can like tell you it and then you go and trade it. Like, you know, somebody can tell you it and alert you of its presence, but then you have to go and um, watch its presence and understand it live. Um, when looking to short low hangers, how do you choose which is the main low hanger to watch? Uh, I always seem to catch the, normally when I, when I have a, a, a bunch of low hanger, I put trades on all of them. Oh, like, okay. So I guess I didn't get to that part of the question. Do you just get locates for them all? Yeah. Um, as long as it, normally low hangers are kind of cheap because they're low hangers, right? Um, so I, I will, as long as they're cheap, if it's like a four cent low hanger, I just skip them that one, right? I'll wait for it to pop and then I'll consider locating it. And if it's gone, then screw it. That's, that's the way I, um, met, that's the way I deal with it. Bow might be different. Bow's much more of a long, low, uh, not long, low hanging fruit trader than I am. He might low, he, he probably has a higher threshold for the locate costs than I do. Hey traders, this is Tosh. I go by T Bradley 90 in the My Investing Club chat. Just wanted to reach out and say if you have any questions about MIC, joining MIC, maybe you're a member already, you have three ways to contact myself personally and through MIC. You can hit our social media, you can hit me through PMs in chat, or you can contact us through my email at Tosh at myinvestingclub.com. That's T O S H at myinvestingclub.com. I will get back to you in a timely manner, and I'm saying this because I'm here to help, and I don't want anybody to be afraid to reach out and ask any question that they have. We are here for you guys. All right, see you guys.